Hello, everyone. I am Susan Gerbig. I was an attendee at SciCon 2023 held in Las Vegas, Nevada, the last weekend of October. What you are looking at is a video on a playlist of other videos. These are quick takes that I made during the conference. I was not asked to make these videos. I am not a videographer. I just simply used my iPhone. And so these are mostly unedited videos. I hope that you go through the playlist and get a sense of what PsyCon was like. Most of the videos on my playlist are not going to make it into the final cut when Center for Inquiry, that is the conference, um, releases their videos in starting in January of 2024. Some might, some won't. Um, and so I tend to capture just bits and pieces as I go. What you're looking at right now in this video is the Sunday paper uh, presentation, which is held on October 29th, 2023. And you're about to see Katie Dyer. She is a professor of at the Department of Child and Family Science in the University, California State University, Fresno. And Katie will be talking about the problem with common sense, naive realism prevents learning. It's very interesting. The Sunday paper talks are usually my favorite part of the entire conference, besides hanging out with people that I'm meeting for the first time and people that I have known for years. In the description of this video, you will see a um, abstract and bio for Katie and her talk. Please check out Center for Inquiry's YouTube channel. Please subscribe and set the alarm bell for Center for Inquiry so you will see more of the talks as they start rolling out, plus the talks from the past, which are amazing. Um, my own channel is just um, bits and pieces of my life. If you're interested, uh, please go ahead and look through the different various videos and playlists I have. But what you're looking at on this playlist are various aspects of PsyCon 2023. I hope you enjoy. Leave me comments, like, and subscribe if you are so inclined. And thanks. This uh, is going to talk to us about a very interesting problem about learning. And she is also one of the founders of the Lidenfeld Alliance for teaching of uh, critical thinking and rational skepticism. So Professor Katie Dyer is a professor of child and family science at the Fresno campus of the California State University. Her research includes the study of infant sleep and parenting, as well as pedagogies in higher education and efforts to reduce false beliefs in students. She has published two textbooks, one on parenting education and one on research methods in human development and family science. And she's going to talk to us today about the problem with common sense and how naive realism in students can actually prevent learning. So please welcome on stage Professor Katie Dyer. I am at Fresno State and I want to talk to you about some of the work that I do with my students. Uh, this is my textbook and I bring it up because it will become relevant in a moment. I was writing the textbook uh, while I was teaching this class and at the time that I taught the class I'm going to tell you about, they only had access to it online and I'll tell you why that's relevant in a minute. But I teach research methods in human development and family science. My students have to take this class before they're allowed to take content area classes. Um, these are the fail rates over many semesters. This is a hard class. Uh, it's rough. Um, in the social sciences, professors are very clear that our students need to be learning research methods. Uh, when, when, when we interview professors, they say students need basic science literacy, we want to promote critical thinking, scientific thinking. So the teachers really, really want their students to have these classes, but uh, students feel differently. 
When we interview students, they say, I don't see how this is relevant to my major. The class is really difficult. It promotes a lot of anxiety. Uh, they say that the content is uninteresting, which is uh, a surprise to those of us who do research. We don't understand where they're coming from, frankly. Um, and they say this just isn't something I, I need to learn about. And, and then they always kind of add this, this whole thing is dumb and stupid, thing, right? And so I, it's a hard class to teach. This sort of attitude stumps those of us who, who teach research methods because we like it. But, but I'm setting the stage for what you know happened in March of 2020. Uh, everything shut down. Um, here's my campus. This is our, our library. I have a gorgeous campus. Unlike every other university campus, it was, it was just void of people. Uh, that might be the only time I've ever seen that. that uh, it's called Peace Park, completely empty. Uh, one of the ways I coped during the shutdown is I started collecting memes that I enjoyed and I would have parties with my friends where, on Zoom where we would share memes. So I'm gonna share a few of them with you as I talk. Uh, you remember what it was like, right? We, these were hard, hard times. As the summer rolled around, it became clear that we weren't gonna be able to come back in the fall. My university provided training for faculty to teach online, and uh, boy, I signed up. I was anxious. How am I gonna do this? I have one of the hardest, the hardest class in my major. I deeply believe in its importance. I deeply believe in the importance of my discipline, and I teach the hardest class, and how are my students gonna do this? You know, it's hard enough when we're in person. How are they gonna do this online? I spent my summer, I know I'm a few, I was a few years behind the trend, but I spent my summer making materials for this class. I was gonna do it right, you know? I really wanted to do this, this class to help these students. Well, in that training, they told us what you should do is survey your students before the semester starts to figure out exactly what are the challenges they're facing. So a learning needs survey, and, and I, I required my students to complete the learning needs survey before the semester started. So I asked them things like, how many of you have unstable Wi-Fi? And, and my institution actually responded to this one uh, uh, robustly. We, you know, they, they bought a bunch of iPads, hotspots. They really tried to, to counteract this one. Lack of private workspace, though, is a problem. I'm going to show you how many of my students have struggled with lack of private workspace. My student population is mostly Mexican and Hmong immigrant, and many of my students attended class from their closet because in their bedroom their siblings were doing their elementary school, things like that. Um, a lot of them. So, so I was asking, how many of you are going to have these issues? We have a lot of student parents. We have a lot of older siblings who are responsible for the care of their younger siblings. Uh, a lot of my students were kind of frontline workers, and if their parents lost their jobs, the students would take on more hours to help make the, make the rent. And so these were going to be big problems. I also asked about things that are always a problem, uh, like what is your interest in this class, right? And some of my students were sort of freaking out about going to school online. And a lot of my students don't uh, essentially devote enough time. So I asked all of these things because I wanted to know in advance, what are we facing? Now, always on the first day of class, I talk about the difference between what we know from science and what we know from common sense. And so just because I was going to be talking about it on the first day, and I was doing the survey in advance. I asked, to what extent do you agree that human development and family science is just common sense? And they answered this question. And I asked it solely for the purpose of, of uh, being able to have discussion on the first day. We got closer and closer, right? And uh, it was pretty terrifying. Um, I didn't have a setup in my home to be teaching from home. This is an end of my bedroom. We moved furniture so that I could so that I could teach because I didn't have a desk. You can see that's a cardboard box that my laptop is sitting on. I mean, it, I know it was rough for students. 
it was rough on us too, I'm telling you. It was hard. Um, and, and yes, I know a lot of folks had that sort of set up in their home. The teaching online thing was hard and the learning online thing was, was hard. It kept coming. Um, some of these just really captured how it felt for the teachers. Uh, because I'm a scientist and because I study pedagogy, I wanted to take the opportunity to sort of track how this went. You know, what are the issues that are going to really be, um, that our students are really, that are really going to impact outcomes for my students? So here are my students. I had two sections that each had 60 students in them. Um, uh, I think Rodney said his, his population was largely female. Look at what I'm working with, 95% female. This is what my department is. You can see that the vast majority of my students are either Hispanic or Hmong, and about 20% were retaking the class, so the anxiety was pretty high as we were going into this. But my question was, which of those barriers, you know, and, and you might be making a, a, some hypotheses yourself, I thought it was going to be the lack of private workspace. I thought, you're just not going to be able to do this class if you have no private place to go to study. Our, our uh, library on campus normally gets a lot of use because students do not have workspaces and they do it at home. My outcome was going to be objective test scores. I've been using the same exams. Each semester I modify them a bit, but they're pretty well established. Uh, I've been using them for a while. Here's some of the uh, like how many of my students were facing these things. You can say a third of them said they didn't have reliable Wi-Fi, but three quarters of them said they had no private place to work. Um, a third of them had caregiving responsibilities, either they were parents or they care for their siblings. Um, about a third really are not that interested in the class. 50% uh, had a lot of anxiety about the online format. Um, I asked them, how much time do you intend to spend on this class? And by my judgment, three quarters of them have unrealistic expectations and were intending to spend less time than they were really going to need. Um, and then I just analyzed that other item because it was there. And I found, what I have found in the past is that about a third of my students think you don't need to study children and families because, you know, we live in families, and we were children, and we know children, and so it's all common sense. So about a third of my students had that attitude. Uh, this, the experience of, of teaching online for the first time when you had, we mostly talked into a void, and we saw a screen with a bunch of black boxes, and all the microphones were off, and nobody said anything. And, and I thought this was funny because it was an insight from what it was like for the students on the other side. When we're looking at it, we're looking at black boxes, nobody's saying anything. So you just keep talking because what else are you going to do, you know? Uh, but it was awkward and uncomfortable for all of us. The, the course I was in said put people in breakout rooms because <laughs> students need to connect to other students. So I would do it. And I would jump from room to room, how's it going in here, guys? And I would find four black boxes with all mics off. They just sat there for 10 minutes in a breakout room, nobody talking. They would complain to me, I would talk about it in a large group, but no response, of course. You know, I'm just talking to the black boxes. I mean, uh, I know I'm not the only one in the room who had this experience, but this was pretty hard. <laughs> It was pretty hard on teachers. <laughs> I know it was pretty hard on students, too. We just sort of held through, you know, until we were close to the end. And uh, what are you going to do? Um, to be very frank about it, um, if, if I went back to that slide about fail rates, you'll see that my fail rate was lower that semester than it was any other because, like everybody else, I lowered standards a bit because we didn't know how to handle the situation. But it was not good. It was not good. Um, I measured a couple of the things that I want to mention. I, I measured GPA. I looked at everybody's GPA because prior academic performance always predicts future academic performance, right? This, so, so whatever this is, it's like how, how good are you at school? That's going to predict how well they do in the future. The time per week, and this is what I want to mention, I was writing that textbook and it did not exist in print yet. So the only way they could read the book is if they went into our learning management system in Canvas. And Canvas tells me 
day by day exactly how many minutes each person is in Canvas. So I had a proxy for how much time they were actually spending working on the class, including reading the book, because the only way they could get the book was there. And you can see that on average, my students are spending six hours or so a week. Um, but please notice the range on that. I had one student who spent an average of one hour a week, and I have one student, um, and I know who this is, and um, I'm sorry to say she did not pass, who spent an average of 23 hours a week um, on this class. So that range is pretty interesting, really. Um, how did they do? Um, not great. Um, these scores, test scores, are about 10 points lower than they usually are when classes are face-to-face. -face. Um, but I wanted to know which of those things caused this problem, right? Because if you looked at the exam scores, you see people are still getting A pluses in this class. And I actually have a fairly high A rate. I always have a rate of A's of 25% or something. There's always a lot of people who do just really great. It's a super fun class. I know people are all sorry. Super fun class, super interesting, well taught, you know, all those things. Um, but a huge range. So who is it that was not doing well? You know, was it the people attending class in the closet? Or was it, was it somebody else, somebody who just didn't have stable Wi-Fi? Who was it that was not doing well? So, so um, here's the results. I used a backwards stepwise linear regression. I added all those variables, and, and the, the, um, the regression pulls them out. If they, kind of, they fall out, we say, of the model, if they are not uh, significant given the other things that are in the model. So <laughs> the Wi-Fi thing, not relevant at all. It was completely unrelated to whether they said they were going to have Wi-Fi problems. That's a surprise to me. Um, anxiety about online format, uh, surprise to me, not correlated the tiniest little bit. Just not at all. It made it a hard experience for people, but apparently it didn't affect their grades. Whether they were working during class time, uh, not relevant. I mean, are you guys as surprised as I am? <laughs> this, was, this was such a surprise to me, all of these things. Um, I'm a family scientist, super interested in student parents. Student parents always have uh, very onerous challenges that other students don't have. This is the one I thought was going to just shine through. It's got to be about caregiver responsibilities. It, it appeared to be relevant, but it disappeared when I put all of the variables into the model. It wasn't the driving force, in other words. <laughs> what about this one? I thought, well, it has to just be how much time they're actually spending, right? If you're not spending, if you're not reading the book, you're not going to know the stuff. That's all there is to it. Falls out of the model. It was not relevant. And, and by this time, I'm pretty stymied by this. Okay, what stays in the model? Your prior grades. That is no surprise. That was in there as a covariate. It was not, this is no surprise at all. Literally the only thing that remained significant was their prior measuring common sense. Uh, the, the effect size is essentially a letter grade. When I dichotomized the population into people who said uh, no, or maybe a little bit, I considered those they don't believe in common sense, or I moderately agree, or I, I, I agree to a large extent, those are the people I, I thought, yeah, believe in common sense. And uh, a full letter grade difference in what they earn. This is super surprising to me. I really thought that I was doing a study about uh, uh, online learning. That's what I thought I was doing a study of. And it turns out that's not what was happening here. Um, overall, online was harder on students, but it seems to be harder on all students kind of equally. The issue is this belief in common sense. So what is happening here? Um, I, I went back to the literature and I read Scott Lilienfeld and some papers of his I hadn't read before. Um, Thomas and Kowalski wrote a book about, uh, I'm sorry, a paper about refutational learning. They talk about this thing called naive realism, which uh, is a, flaw, a philosophical concept, but psychologists kind of adopted it in the 90s. The conviction that one's own observations are obviously correct. Right? Because I go through the world and I, I know what happened to me is real. So we say things like, I know it's real because I experienced it. 
right? We, and all of us kind of have this sense that if other people are biased, we understand how that happens. But, you know, if I experienced it, I think we heard something about this with the Havana syndrome, didn't we, uh, Rob? The, the, I experienced it so I know it must be real. And what goes along with that is that when other people disagree with us, we assume that they are either ignorant, maybe stupid, uh, or, or certainly biased. They have some, some bias in that way. So this is the concept of naive realism, and I, I, I think that's what's happening here. Uh, it reminds me of the, do you remember George Carlin said, uh, uh, other people uh, driving slower than you are idiots and faster than you is a maniac, right? So the way I am assessing danger and safety is appropriate because I trust myself and I believe that I am a really objective and reasonable person. But, but if people are different from me, right, they're, they're, uh, they're the ones who are at fault. Now, in uh, the pedagogy uh, of the, I'm sorry, research on pedagogy, this concept has been identified at first actually in physics, belief in naive physics. Um, people sort of believe, have certain beliefs about, about the way objects work in the world, and the more attached they are to those naive physics, the worse they do in their physics classes. It's been demonstrated the same thing in chemistry classes, the same thing in biology classes, and in psychology classes. Um, I think it's even more relevant in human development and family science just because of the universality of our experiences, right? So, so in, in say, a chemistry class, people might not necessarily think of themselves as experts from their personal lives, but when you're talking about a parenting, or romantic relationships, everybody's pretty sure you know, that they have some experiences that make them experts. Um, a couple of things here that are, are very relevant with relationships and children is the uh, hindsight bias. Let me do that first. That's the, the, the notion that when something is in the past and you know it, you really come to believe that you sort of always knew that, right? <laughs> and that if you, uh, if you hadn't known it, you would have been able to guess. That's the hindsight bias. And it's also called the obviousness effect. Once something feels obvious, you're pretty sure you always knew it. And I think this is what's happening when my students say to me, I like the child and family classes because, you know, they're, they're obvious to me. So what they're thinking is I'm not studying, I don't have to study very hard. But, but this is a hindsight. In hindsight, it feels very obvious once they know what's going on. The familiarity heuristic actually was mentioned the other day on stage, and I'm sorry, I can't remember who it was, but, but the discussion about how do microwaves work, and could we actually explain how objects in our environment work. Because we are familiar with these things, we have the sense that we sort of know how to, how to work them, or how they work, but then if someone presses you to explain, you know, how does your refrigerator work exactly? And most of us really struggle to explain things like that that are part of our everyday life. So I think the same thing happens with uh, personal relationships. They're so familiar, we just really feel like uh, it's so obvious. <laughs> um, I want to conclude by saying there are, there are three reasons I wanted to share this story with you and, and in this way. Number one, science is so exciting and wonderful because we get surprised sometimes, right? We, uh, it's actually quite rare that, that humans do things to set ourselves up where we could genuinely be surprised, right? Often our surprises are unpleasant because we, we keep ourselves sort of on track so we're, we never have to face this. But science allows genuine surprises because falsifiability is built in. And, and that's pretty rare and wonderful and I think it's fun. For me, this was the most fun part of this project. This is not the most compelling data in the world, right? It's, it's I have two classes at one university. It was during a pandemic. Do I really know what's going on? Uh, no, these are not the most compelling data in the world. But the fun of science is being surprised once in a while. That's, that is way cool. Now the second part is, um, at first it was slightly disappointing to me. Um, I submitted this paper, and the reviewers kind of just as I presented it to you. And the reviewers were a little confused. They're like, is this a, is this a paper about education? <laughs> like online education? Or is this a paper about something else? And it didn't work because the story is not the way the scientific record works. 
the scientific record works by, by scientific papers having a particular format. I had to rewrite this paper in a particular format that sort of assumed that this was my research question. <laughs> so I rewrote the paper to say my hypothesis was that naive realism would interfere with learning, right? That wasn't at all what I was doing. Um, but I had to rewrite the paper that way because the scientific record works in a particular way, and it's a shame that some of the fun parts of science are invisible when all we look at are the published papers. So thank you for the opportunity to tell you the story because I think it's way more fun and it says a little something about science. The last thing I want to do is, is brag just a little bit, if you don't mind. Um, when the reviewers reread the revision, uh, you know, they had all said, I think this is the wrong journal. This is the family relations is, is, a, is a really important uh, uh, journal for my discipline. The only people who read it really are family scientists. These are my people, okay? <laughs> and they reviewed the paper and said, Maybe you should send this to an education journal because we, we don't understand what's happening. When I rewrote it in the standard way, three of the four reviewers wrote back to me and said, oh my goodness, we need to read this paper and thank you so much for sending it to us because the issue of naive realism, false beliefs, um, uh, cognitive biases, so far, this has never been published in any of our family science journals, and this is our chance to talk about it. And the reviewers, you know, they hadn't seen that on the first revision, but then they saw it later. And, and I'm pleased, and one of them even said, um, once this is published, and I know who you are because it's anonymous, uh, I, I want to collaborate with you because I want to study students on my campus. So I'm really pleased that, that this has uh, finally entered kind of the lexicon of my own discipline. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. That concludes the four talks, but we would like to ask all.